Okay, I think we're ready. Do you guys think we're ready in the room? Okay. So we just have a few people in the room and we've got some more people online and we're gonna record for those who couldn't make it today. So welcome in, I am Aaron Kral. I'm a senior lecturer in the English department, I'm the president of our faculty union and I'm one of the co-chairs of our bargaining team. And we've invited Howard Bunsis to come back to us again this semester virtually to give us a more detailed presentation on the financial condition of UIC. Howard is a professor of accounting at Eastern Michigan University, and he knows more about the University of Illinois finances than anyone else I know. I think he probably knows more about the university's finances than our university's administrators, or at least he's willing to share more of what he knows. That's than a they low know. bar. That's a very little <laughs> bar. So, yeah. um, so we're excited today um, to hear Howard's sort of full analysis of what's going on at our university, particularly in light of bargaining. We've been pushing economic proposals back and forth at the bargaining table. The university tells us, as they always do, uh, that, that they don't have any money or certainly not enough money to pay for the raises that we are asking for. Uh, we're hoping that Howard has found something different. So Howard, I'm gonna turn it over to you and um, take it away. We'll say, Thank and then you. we'll have some time for uh, some Q&A afterwards. Yeah, you know, in terms of Q&A, you guys can, I'm gonna keep the chat open. If someone wants to write a question in the chat, I will address it as I'm talking. Uh, great. And it's great to see all of you. Uh, been coming there for many, many years and always love it there. And very proud of the work we've done together and very proud of what you guys have accomplished as a union. And I, uh, someone sent me the proposals you guys had this morning, uh, you know, the contract language, uh, and it was good to see all that. And we just went through a strike at my place. I don't know if you guys know that we were on strike for about a week uh, in the summer. No, September, I guess not summer. Uh, and so understand the difficulties of bargaining in this environment. And uh, I want to share with you. So I, I shared previously with uh, the team a uh, shorter version of this. This is 86 slides. And I know you're probably saying, where is the door? Could you just, just, I just come on now. I'm not going to go through every number on, on all 86, but you guys asked me to do something. There's no, there's no, there's only one way to do it. You can't just, I can't just half you know you this is a pretty complicated place and there's one thing i do want to talk about with transparency that i really want to push and you guys could decide tell me what you want so anyway so i'm going to spend very little time on the ui system just i just want to have to get it out there but i need to talk about why i'm talking about the ui system not to, but everything else you see is all uic and uh i am going to get athletics in there i know uh there's various degrees of sports fandom among you uh and not you're not a big sports fan as me, but uh, certainly, uh, and I've been to UIC Flames games, so there you go. I've probably been to more games than some of you guys have. So uh, well, that's an exaggeration. So okay, so UI system. I'm sorry to dwell on this first point. The UIC financials are embedded in the system data. Now you're not the only Illinois is not the only public education higher education system in the country, uh, California, uh, New York, uh, and there are others, Connecticut. Uh, but like New York, Illinois does not report in an audited way the financial results of the separate universities. New York's got the excuse in SUNY of having 64 institutions within it. Uh, CUNY has the excuse of having 23 within it, within it, roughly, depending on how you count. But in California, we were able to get, work with the union there, to get legislation about 2012 that ensured that when they issue their financial statements for the California State University system, that there will be individual campus audited statements within that, within those statements. I'm showing you stuff today that, I have to extrapolate. I have to use iPads data. Uh, the audited data that I'm requesting that I think you should be requesting is there. They couldn't put the audit together without it. Uh, you know, Chicago and Urbana are, and Springfield are all very different places. My view is this, 
they don't want to show how much the system office is really draining. That's my view. Uh, I, I, I'm not being not saying anything to be nice or to gain favor with any of you. I'm saying what I believe to be true. I think the system office is pretty big in terms of what they, in terms of how many people are there and how much of the appropriation they take. And I think it. I think they don't want that talked about. And the you know the pluses. Just let me say this. I, I know you guys want to get to this stuff. The pluses and minuses of a, of a system. The big plus is that they feel, and maybe you, some of you feel that when it goes to getting state appropriation money from Springfield, that as a system you do better than if UIC was going there separately and UIUC was going there separately and UIS was going there separately. That is very problematical in my estimation, but that is the theory behind it. Uh, in Oregon, they broke up. You know, they they broke up the system there. They were eight, and they they all they they just dismantled the system in 2015 uh, because the campuses wanted more autonomy, and they were too different from each other. And uh, you guys have all been to Urbana. I, I predict every one of you has been to Urbana. Uh, so if resources are not shared. Based on need, well, I, I think you guys also have a pretty good case to make, but that's the way it is. And so we'll do the best we can. And I still could conclude number two here, that UIC separately is doing very well because they're strong cash flows and reserves. And we'll try to get, I, I will try to get, we'll, we'll spend some time on these two things, which is counter the claim that the admin is making that they don't have any. Uh, we'll look at enrollment growth. Uh, the state appropriation slated to increase in the year that we're in now, though the point I made, the U.S. system gets a large chunk. Uh, priorities, expense distribution has been fairly stable throughout the years, though instructional salaries in, in, increased a little bit less. And then, as I showed you guys in the past, the peer group chosen by the union is much more applicable than the one chosen by the administration. So now we're just going to look at the, the U.I. system itself their bond rating came out in 2021 and the ui system is uic uiuc uis and then whatever the state whatever the central office takes and what they they upgraded the bond rating to a very strong aa3 favorable operating performance balance sheet growth strong enrollment growth uh, pandemic support and the state, by the way, the state of Illinois has one of the lowest bond ratings of any state in the country. I don't think I needed to tell you that, but I was an Illinois resident for seven years, so I'm allowed to say it. Okay, if I, it wouldn't be fair of me to say if I had never lived in the city of Chicago, but I did live in the city of Chicago for seven years. I'm allowed to say uh, things about the state, your state, uh, and it's been, it's been this way for a while. But the university is in much better shape than this, and I think it would be even higher. The other thing a state system does, I'm, I'm doing several of these reports, and uh, I just finished a report last night for the University of Michigan, and I was able to use the 2022 audited statements for the University of Michigan. Well, the statements for the system, because of the complexities of a system office, those won't be out. The fiscal year ended in June. It ended four and a half months ago. Um, but we're not going to get that information until next April or May because of the way things work, which, again, is not appropriate. So anyway, it's good things, though. Balance sheet growth, strong enrollment, uh, market strength beyond the state. The Big Ten, obviously, is not UIC. It's uh, UI, or it's Urbana. Uh, but this is everything. There's everyone added together. A lot of cash diverse revenues, all good things. Uh, and these, the, the rating itself of AA3, this is all the public and privates. So very few have AAA. And a couple in the Big Ten do. Michigan and Indiana uh, do have AAA ratings. But a lot of these are private universities that have them. It's still a pretty solid rating. There's no doubt about it. So uh, this is just getting at the UI system, and I've got two metrics here that we're going to use. And I, accounting class starts right now, so hang with me. Are you ready? Joe, I know you're ready. I don't know about the rest of you guys. Changing in assets is what 
just net income or profit. That's what it's called in the in the, we just it's just what we call it in the for pro in the not for profit sector. It's the same thing as a company's revenues versus versus expenses. It just calls something different. And then it, cash inflows versus cash outflows. So many expenses are non cash. We had big non cash investment gains in twenty one. Uh, we've had investment losses in other years. And so cash flows, we think, tell a bit better of the story. Rudy and I, Rudy Fichtenbaum, you guys, I'm sure many of you guys know Rudy. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for a while now. And we really, we, whether you believe it or not, we constantly, we talk almost all, every day, but we constantly change the way we approach things. And if Rudy and I, you know, if, if we looked at when we started this in 2004, 2005, and where we are today uh, doing these type of analysis, the number one thing that we've changed is the focus on cash flows, because that's the money that they pay you out of. That's the, the claim they could pay you out. And that's what really matters more than anything. And so we definitely focus more on cash flows. And these are in, you know, that's $600 million, uh, which is an, a lot of money. And so this is the system. You can see the system for the system itself. And we'll, we're going to do this graph for UIC. There was a down year here. You may remember what happened to the state appropriation that year. You guys remember they decided to like not give anybody any money for a year and then they kind of made it up. Do you guys remember that? Or remember when they just decided? Yeah, things were kind of, remember things were kind of dicey. You guys do remember that? I, I was in your state when that was going on. And uh, yeah, it, it was definitely problematical. But the reason the green lines hide the blue line is there's non-cash expenses that drive that make this low and make the blue line lower. But still, in general, you can see things are, other than that one year, positive, and they're moving in the same direction. So now, I promise it wasn't long. Now it's UIC only. And you can see the source I'm using. Uh, it's IPEDS, Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System of the U.S. Department of Education. You guys, uh, Karen Carlson, you remember. Uh, the IPEDS data for 21 is not publicly available yet. You guys, as a union, I asked you guys to get it, and about 48 hours later, you guys had it. Uh, I think at some level, you guys have a decent relationship with, with some members of your administration, maybe not the highest levels, but you guys are able, to, you're always able to get data that I asked for uh, rather easily. Doesn't seem to be that that part going on. Though the transparency with other things, I don't think they have a choice. I think the system controls a lot of that. That's my view. I, I don't think the people that run your place have a lot to say about some things in terms of what they can share with you. But in general, we see assets going up, which is nice. Uh, debt level liabilities coming down, net assets, and we'll see how much of this almost two over $2 billion of reserves going up. So it's a pretty, you can't make a definitive conclusion from this graph, but it's a nice, it's still nice to have a graph that looks like that in terms of the balance sheet. And so of the $2.2 .2 billion, how much are reserves? How much are these reserves? And we have these categories of net assets, and we'll go into them. The one that matters the most is this one down here, almost a billion dollars. And you can see a big increase, though. And a lot of this increase in 2021 was the value of investments outside of any foundation, just the investments that UIC holds in their bank accounts, uh, paper gains. But there were other things also. They also, as we'll see, uh, a lot of money came from the feds. A lot of money came from the state. Expenses were not nearly as high as they forecasted, and it generated large surpluses. So in terms of reserves, there are four categories. There's one, two, three, four categories of the net assets of the $2.2 billion. This tied up in the buildings, we don't even think about that. That's not part of reserves. This is people who give money to UIC and say, you can't spend it unless there are strings attached. So that doesn't count either. This is UIC has set aside money for typically two purposes, future scholarships for low and middle income students and paying off debt, making sure debt principal payments can be paid off in the future. Now you can't use this, this category here to pay faculty salaries. However, uh, it's nice to have pretty important needs covered such as debt service and future scholarships, because you want to make sure that you that UIC is still affordable to people 
uh, from all walks of life. And I know how important that is uh, to many of you and how important it is to, it's, it's important, to, it's part of the culture at UIC. Uh, and then unrestricted is unrestricted no matter what the administration says. Now the admin is going to say that night, they're going to say this money can't be touched. Even though it says unrestricted, it can't be touched. But here's the way you address that. Oh, it's tied up in the departments. Oh, it's in the colleges. Oh, it's earmarked for. The external auditors would not put it in this category unless it really was free. If there were no way you can get out of a contract, hands completely tied, can't touch the money, it would be in this one. It would be here. But it's here, so it's good to see. So we look at the reserves like that, and most of the reserves of over a billion dollars are completely unrestricted, and we compare them to annual expenses, and we get a primary reserve ratio. And then, and I, if, if I could do some math, if you don't mind, just to keep you guys engaged, 32.8% is the $1 billion with a lot of numbers attached to it over the total expenses that UIC has of $3.6 billion. It's a big place, by the way. That's how we got the 32.8%. And then the 3.94 months is the 32.8% times 12 months. And you can see it's much higher than it ever has been going back all the way to 15. And we'll look at the reasons why I mentioned a couple of investment returns uh, tuition revenue being strong, state appropriation being strong. Those are all reasons why. And federal health money, federal uh, higher education emergency relief fund money. All those together helped uh, create a pretty good situation there. And so you get, this is what the reserves look like graphically. You can really see how uh, different 21 was versus other years. Uh, I think what they're probably saying at the bargaining table, here's what I'm thinking, is that where my, cursor, where my cursor is now for 22, it's not as big as this. My answer to that would be, okay, if you say it's not as big as this, then show me. Show us the balance sheet of 630.22. You can't just say you don't have reserves anymore. You can't just say this went to this level, which I doubt it did. My guess is it's probably about the same level, but maybe even a little higher. But I'm sure they're saying 22 was not that 21 was an aberrational year in terms of HERF money and returns on the on the stock market. And not that, that 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 really matters all that much anyway, but I'm sure that's what they're saying. And that we don't have the money in 22. And this money just got us through the pandemic and now we're through that, but we can't go ahead and make a commitment, a multi-year commitment to you based on something that happened that increased one time. Is that sound about what they're saying? Yes, no, maybe. Anybody? Okay, I'll assume that's I assume that's a yes. Okay. Here's debt. And the way that UIC does not borrow money separately, but the system assigns you debt. And some of the debt is for projects in Chicago on the Chicago campus. Uh, and so that's and there are other ways they allocate the debt, but they allocate the debt to your campus. And you can see about just under half a billion dollars of debt. And the good thing is the debt keeps going down because they correct me if I'm wrong, I've been there a lot of times and there used to be a lot of construction. Is there a lot of construction going on these days? I would guess not. What do you, what do you guys say? What say you? A lot of construction on campus in Chicago or not? There's a little construction. Anybody? You guys are allowed to talk back to me. Some, but not a ton. Okay. Yeah, engineering in West Campus, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, you guys could talk in there in the chat. That'd be great. So, and, and so maybe there'll be maybe this borrowing coming up here in twenty two, but I don't think so. Uh, but you can see the reserves compared to debt are in good shape. These are the assets, and unfortunately, because we don't, because UI the UI system and UIC do not provide us with a complete balance sheet for your campus separately. These are the only categories of assets we have. Within this current assets are investments having nothing to do with any foundation, just investments because every year they take in more than they spent and they invest the excess. 
That's what this green bar is. The orange bar are the building. You can see current assets have generally gone up from 670 million. Now they're almost just under 900 million. Went down a little from 20 to 21. Capital assets, this is the buildings. And you can see 1.2 billion now worth 1.4 billion. Uh, but that's the only categories we got because we don't have anything else going on. Now here's, to me, if you said to me, what's the most important number to show them and prove to them that they have the resources to meet the demands that we are making at the table, it would be what you're looking at here. That's my, this is my feeling. And I'm on page uh, 17. I will send you this whole thing, of course. The only reason I didn't, I don't send it earlier because I, when I do these, I always see something that I have to change or, but I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen anything bad yet, but I will get this to you. Uh, and you guys, you know, in terms of the recording and in terms of this, you don't have to ask me my permission. You can do whatever you want with them. It's, it's your, you guys know what to do with this stuff better than I do and how to do it. So anyway, so what I got here, uh, it's my effort to try to figure out what their cash flows are to deal with, uh, to take, you know, to deal with all the non, get rid of all the non-cash stuff and get to what I think are their cash flows. Now, they may have a statement of cash flows for UIC only somewhere in the system office. But unless they show it to us, this is what we got to do. We got to extrapolate from iPads data. And I still think it's pretty, I, to me, this looks pretty right. Generating $328 million of extra cash in 21. And you can see the one year that was negative was the year where the appropriation tanked. Other than that, there have been positive excess cash flows. That means the cash in versus the cash out is better every year. And though I still wish I had a real cash flow statement, this is still pretty good evidence. And here it is graphically. So I think my view from a bargaining standpoint is you claim you don't have any money. Well, these this data, which you submit, this is not my data. This is submit. They submit this data to the federal government. Suggests that these that these are the cash flows. If you have different data, if you have a more precise cash flow, uh, then show it to us. I don't think they ever will. Uh, and but so this is what we got now, and I think it tells it tells a pretty good story. This is the same graph I showed you earlier for the system. You know, we had the cash flows, and then we had on top and then the, uh, the the system and then the UIC. And you could see UIC and the system are, you know, they're moving okay. I mean, I've always, the way my general rule of thumb is UIC is about 30, somewhere between 35 and 44% of the whole system. So with de depending on whether you consider assets, revenues, state appropriation, enrollment, it depends on which metric you use. You know what I'm saying? To say how big is UIC compared to the UI system? You know what I'm saying? It's, it depends on which metric you use. You're somewhere in there. And okay, so as the system is moving, you guys are moving, so great. So, okay. And this is the same graph from before uh, for them, for you as for them. You guys move, you move just as they moved, which I think makes sense that because you guys are such a big part of the system. And I don't think UIUC's finances are all that different than yours. Now, the one thing I will say, though, before I, I, I want to ask this, do they claim that the reason that we are different than UIUC and you can't extract is that we, the hospital and everything associated with the medical, the medical uh, complex is different than uh, in Urbana. Do you, do they claim that the, the hospital's making all the money and you guys are you guys are losing money? They ever, they ever throw that at you? Yeah, we hear that. I I thought I heard. Is that a yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they, we hear that kind of thing definitely. So it's hard. You know, it's it's hard to without the audit statements to to disprove that, but. I, I mean, I, I am going to have some hospital stuff here to try to counter. I just wanted to hear, hear from you guys whether they are making that kind of argument that, yeah, we may have some money as a whole UIC, but it's all because the hospital is making money. You guys who teach 
what did you say to you know english or political science you guys are you guys are just costing us money and it's the hospital that's making the money and it says anyone making money it's like it is at every school i'm not putting anyone down but you know engineering you guys are making all the money and and all the rest of all of us are you know where whatever we are when yeah at my place, by the way, they they even took our building away from where I, you know I, I'm in a business school, and they shoved this aside for the for the technology group, and uh, they the arts and sciences and business. We're now yesterday's news. Am I allowed to say that we're yesterday's news? That's the way the, the world is going. I don't, I don't know if it's that way at your place too, but they try to pit us off against each other. Uh, and do they try that with you guys too? Pit college against college, and they try that stuff a little. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's look at the revenue base. Now, I'm sorry. I apologize. There are a ridiculous amount of numbers here. And I promise I'm not going to spend much time because I got graphs. I want to go to a couple of things. First, at the top is tuition. So there's the hospital. It's like a big look at the look at the size. Look at the size. It's 800 million. 600 million in 15. That's huge growth. I want to talk about this drop in auxiliary. I'm sure auxiliaries, we're talking housing, dining, student union, bookstore, parking, athletics, uh, and sometimes conferences and centers and things of that nature uh, all go into what's called auxiliary. And you can see from 19 to 20, a little decline, but a pretty big decline due to the pandemic uh, from 20 to 21. And I'm sure that's something they talked about. Uh, Here's that state appropriation that we talked about. I mean, I talked to you, you all, some of you in the chat said, of course, we remember. Well, I just want to point out that you see it right here. Uh, you know, 16 being the one year that UIC's cash flows were negative. The reason UIC's cash flows were negative in 2016 was because the state appropriation went from 200 million to 68 million uh, and has picked up since. Uh, and I saw your governor got reelected last or Tuesday night. I believe he got reelected pretty easily, I imagine. And you guys already had a Democratic legislature. Can I just put a plug in for my state of Michigan, which for the first time in 40 years has now a Democratic legislature, both houses. Uh, we didn't think there was a chance that was happening. And uh, it was just a tremendous uh, surprise. We're really thrilled that it did. So anyway, uh, these are other grants these grants have the federal money in them and the state relief money in them. So, and then there are these, what are called on behalf payments. The, what they're for is their payments, the, it's your employer's payments for their share of retirement and your healthcare premiums and the healthcare costs that you, that you pay for. You pay some, they pay some. Retirement, you put in some, they put in some on your behalf. And these are state systems in, in, in Illinois. And to me, these are not really revenues because uh, they go right, they basically go uh, from the state to UIC to the healthcare providers or to the retirement system. They kind of, they, they don't really stay in UIC very long. They're not, they're not there for you guys to use that much. Though this increase is alarming and there's a lot of reasons for it and a lot of it's paper a lot of it's not even cash so i don't put much stock in what's going on in this incredibly large revenue source and you will see now in the next couple of slides the two big ones the on behalf payments and the hospital i'm going to show you the revenue distributions with and without those items and that's what we're looking at now so here's a little more of a summary i took out some of the smaller items but now the grass so this is everything, okay? And you can see the two big ones. Look at the hospital's revenues going up every year. And these are the on behalf payments, which took this huge jump. And a lot of these are not cash. And this, this increase here is the federal relief money. That right there. And there's tuition. And there's a state appropriation. You can see them. There's what happened in 16. And here's kind of the catching up. So the next graph, the next page, I say, okay, 21 only, UIC with, with and without everything. So here's the on behalf payments and take out the on behalf payments. Without the on behalf payments, you can see 
a lot changes. Tuition goes from just over 10% with everything included. And then you take out the on behalf payments and it goes to 14%. Take out the on behalf payments in the hospital and tuition is up to 23%. Grants and contracts are your biggest revenue. That includes a lot of things. That includes not just relief money, which is uh, going away after 22. It also includes Pell Grant money, which is like tuition money, but it also includes all the research grants. And, and UAC, as you know, is a very heavy research school. So all those grants are in there. So uh, to me, this is the best graph of where you guys really are at. This takes out the hospital. It takes out the on behalf payments and it focuses on everything else. And so, and you can see again, this is the federal relief money here. And it puts the orgs, this graph to me, counters, you're gonna get, you're gonna hear a lot of, oh my God, the auxiliaries are killing us, they, they, they're paying down. Look at the auxiliary drop. You could see it here. This, you know, from this lighter blue to this darker blue over 19 to 21, right where my cursor is. It's not that big a drop in the big scheme of things here. And tuition kept going up, tuition revenue kept going up. And the appropriation, you know, this is kind of a catch up for everything that happened before here. Uh, you didn't always have the same governor you have now. So, all right, enough of that. This is the on behalf payments. I just to, because it's such a big revenue source, I just wanted to show you what they were how they come at you, they came at you, and I, what they're going to, what they're slated, what they were slated to be for 22, and what they're expected to be for 23. And up until 21, they have these special funding, but we don't know what they are here and here. And you can see I got this from the Illinois Board of Higher Education, their budget, but that's where I got this from. This didn't come from iPads, this came from the Illinois Board of Higher Ed. All right, state appropriation. Uh, this is the whole system, and this is you guys below. And again, this is the this is the big drop. And this is why I say you guys are. You can see this is the percentage of UIC as the system. I made assumptions here. I just in twenty twenty one, the entire system got six hundred and twenty eight million dollars from for operating from the state of from Springfield. Of that, two thirty one twenty thirty one million went to UIC. And that's 36.9% of the whole appropriation. And so I just extrapolated that out for 22 and 23. 22, the year's over. 23, the year we're in now is experiencing, is going to experience estimated a $14 million increase in the state appropriation. That is something that is relevant to me at bargaining. One of the main revenue sources that they complain a lot about is now we have now three straight years of increase and the year, the fiscal year we are currently in has the largest increase uh, we've seen. I don't really count, you know, what happened here, it's hard to, it was such a mess, it's not even worth going into, uh, but these are more reliable in, indications of what's going forward. And what's going forward in the current year of 23, I would say anywhere, from 12 to 16 or 17 million will be the increase for UIC in the current year we're in now. And again, this comes from the Illinois Board of Higher Ed. And these are the dollar changes. You can see because of this, it kind of distorts everything what happened when there was a mess. Okay, adjusted for inflation. Now, inflation is obviously a big deal. Though We had an inflation report come out this morning or yesterday, this morning. Right, I think the inflation report came out this morning at seven seven nationally. Is that is anybody with me? Yeah, I think it was this morning. And so, but still, those of us who have been, those of us who are of a certain age, which I am, so, you know, well over sixty, uh, we haven't had inflation like this since we were in college or before that. And uh, I so I adjusted the appropriation on a per student level. And you can see it's certainly the last couple of years. It's there wasn't much difference between the nominal and the the uh, inflation adjusted. It was this morning, thank you, Mariah, uh, until the last couple of years. And now it's going to diverge even more. 
So, uh, and here's the state appropriation adjusted for inflation. I don't have a 23 inflation number yet because, well, we, we have not reached that year. Okay, here is where I wanted to talk about one of the conclusions I made about uh, the system office. Now, this all comes from iPads. It says no data yet. The reason there's no data yet, you guys get, this is not publicly available yet. It will be probably right around Christmas time. New Year's is when this data becomes publicly available, the 21. But you guys got this for UIC. You got this for me earlier. But still, the one I want to point out to you is how much the system office is getting. Now, they're going to claim that we use this not for ourselves, not for admin costs, but we use it for supported scholarships and operations and efficiencies and may all be true. To me, it's a, it's a big number. It's still a big number. They got one sixth of the appropriation in 20. That's a big number. That, that's just my reading of it. You know, looking at a lot of systems over a lot of years, that's just, they, they're capturing way too much, I think. Uh, and it's not getting down to the students. So, all right. Enrollment. Uh, these are fall. This is this is fall twenty one, and again, this comes from the Illinois Board of Higher Ed. And so, there's you guys in in the red color, and you can see UIUC is much larger. This is me being obnoxious. I'm a New Yorker, so I am a brat. I said that the system office had no enrollment. Okay, I admit that that probably is a little, I didn't need to do that. Uh, see, I put a, the, the enrollment in the system office. They, they have no students going to school at the system office. That's a bad joke. But uh, hopefully you guys won't be too mad at me for doing that. Ha ha, thank you, Jack. Well, yeah, you guys are all laughing. I, I figured, I hesitate. I, I, I didn't even think about taking it out once I put it in there, but okay it's it's just too much this is too much i'm sorry this is too much money this is too much they're getting too much system office is getting too much that's my feeling so okay and i have it again this is graphically yeah okay how does illinois stand versus all the other states five years ago you guys were down here now 10th in the country in per capita State appropriation in 2022 per capita state total appropriate not to UIC, but to all of higher ed, including community college. And per $1,000 in personal income in the state, a little lower. Uh, I guess Illinois is somewhat uh, of a richer state. Educational attainment, percent of adults with a bachelor's degree or higher from the U.S. Census Bureau. You can see you guys are a little higher than the national average. Not, don't know what, don't know, this is not really a negotiating thing. I just, I think these are facts that I think you guys should, You, I know you guys, you guys probably find interesting, I find interesting uh, just to know these things. So let's get to the HERF money. So over the three acts, HERF one, two, and three, the last one being the American Rescue Plan, uh, UIC got a total of $145 million, 75 million, no matter what they say, completely discretionary they could basically spend it as they wish no matter what they say they're going to say no way it can only be spent for this. this stuff had to go for student scholarships and student support this is theirs to do what they want and the other thing they'll say of course it is one time don't consider it ignore it it's never going to happen again but it did happen so uh and here i'm able to show what i there's a lot of numbers here but the bottom line of this slide here is a lot of HERF money came to UIC in 22. We don't have the financials yet, but for sure, a lot of money came. Looking at me, looking at the grant money from IPEDS and the federal non-operating grants, and which is the federal HERF dollars, I think another 13 million came to them last year in the year that ended June of 22. All right, enrollment. I do have, I was able to get the fall 22 official enrollment numbers for you guys. And look, I've been, I've always stayed, whenever I come to you guys, I've always said it is incredibly impressive that a school this size with this many students in the middle of such a large city 
continues to have enrollment increase every year. That stopped from fall 21 to fall 22. You can see it right here. But not to show you guys that, first of all, my guess is many of you, you know, the people in, in this call, you guys know this. I think, I don't know what they tell you about enrollment or what they, I don't know what they share with you about enrollment. Uh, but anyway, so by the way, this is like almost the same numbers. It's not, these are, the grad numbers are almost the exact same. Professional numbers you know, the professional schools were almost the exact same. This isn't a huge drop, a 1.3% drop. Uh, we're talking just a couple hundred students, but it is in contrast directionally to what we've seen in the past. So again, what I try to do with all these things is show you the numbers and then show you the tables, uh, the graphs, because I think for me, at least, I like looking at the graphs more, but I think for you guys, especially involved where you are in negotiations, I'd probably put more, if I was doing this kind of presentation in general, uh, I can go to Miami of Ohio, we try to organize the faculty there. By the way, imagine they don't have, imagine a place without a union. Do you remember what it was like when you guys didn't have a union? Do you guys remember those times uh, we, we didn't have a union? Well, Miami of Ohio, and actually, we actually, we, we're gonna have a vote uh, coming up and you guys went through the same thing and I think we're gonna win. But that kind of stuff, I would not show that many, but here, this is the, Tells the story. It's nice. So you can see most of the enrollment increase in the past is driven by undergrad, and that just went down slightly here. But grad is now taking grad and professional and now higher. So a slight shift. I don't know if you feel that, you see that, if that's a focus, uh, if that's intentional. I don't know if I don't know how you guys feel about all that. My view as you are in negotiations, I, I want to give you guys as much information so they just can't say things about enrollment that aren't true. So you, you just have, not that you couldn't have found this data yourself and you didn't have this data yourself, but at least my role here is I, I present it for you and give you the numbers and the percentage changes. So another way I look at it, I like looking at things long-term, not just year to year. So I'm looking from 15 to 19, 19 to 23, and then over that longer eight or nine year period. And See, in total, everything is going up. And 23, uh, just to, you know, 2023 is fall 2022. It's fiscal, you know, the fiscal year we're in now. And again, that, those, that, that stuff came out very recently, within the last two weeks. I think I saw that. I used that. Yeah, it's, it's less than two weeks ago that I got the, the fall 22 numbers. So just get a sense of, the graphic gives you a sense of how that's all moving. By residency, in Illinois, so three groups, your state, out of state, and then international. And you can see the percent from Illinois is now 80%. It was eight to nine years ago, 83%. The percent out of state's been relatively stable. International percentage has creeped up. Uh, it went down during the pandemic, but it's now creeped up again. And I just wanted to point out this highlighted item here, international graduate enrollment, 32% of your graduate students are international students. I don't know if you feel that, see that, encounter that. Obviously, it's a good thing in so many respects. Uh, and I will say this, if I could compare, the decline, the slight decline in international enrollment was much less here than elsewhere. Uh, so... I don't know why. You, you again. I don't know the whys. Uh, you guys live there and may know the whys. But I think international being, you know, as a percentage of the total, it's still. But as a percent of the grad, uh, it's still pretty, uh, pretty strong. So, and there are more international students than out of state students. So, and here, the graph I think is a good, it's a good picture of it. Tuition fee and fee price. Not much here. Not much is changing. They don't have much discretion. The admin doesn't have much discretion. Springfield kind of dictates this. I, one thing I'll say, it's, you know, at, I learned over and over again at UC at Chicago when I was there, there's two things that matter. There's levels and there's changes. The level, the changes here are minimal. In you know, you look at this graph in tuition and fee, the changes are minimal. The level, not so minimal. I know there's a lot of financial aid. That is not cheap to go to school uh, at your place. 
it costs a lot of money to go to school there. And not that it doesn't cost that much where I am or anywhere public university, but that's a lot of money. I don't care who you are, that's a lot of money. So again, maybe you guys are all rich and maybe you guys are not teachers and you guys have some entrepreneurial stuff that you don't know. Maybe you guys are selling Tesla stock on the side. I don't know, but uh, yeah, okay. And so just look, it gets to this graph. Uh, so this graph looks at tuition and fee revenue, a function of the price and enrollment. We don't know the lime green bar for 22 or 23 yet. They know the lime green bar for 22. They being the average. They know what this is. Hey, have you pulled up the, um, the union? Um, what's it called? Is there a question? No, okay. They know this. And my, I think it's probably, given this, it's probably somewhere about 2% increase. This, it's harder to know what's going to happen in 23, given the price increase and the enrollment decline. There's other things that factor into it. Uh, you saw that a lot, a lot of the enrollment decline was in undergrads, and they, this tends to be a higher yield percentage in grad and professional. So uh, my view is that the green bar is doing okay. You know, tuition and fee revenue is about $400 million, and 1% of $400 million well, is about $4 million. So I think this increase was probably about two, 3%, maybe, you know, maybe eight, $10 million. This to me is probably just to be a couple million positive. But I still believe that the number one revenue source tuition is going up, not just in the year that was just completed, but in the year we're in now, we've shown the state appropriation went up and they took a $13 million in HERF money in 22. So that's my view of the revenue side. On the expense side, we focus in IPEDs. I just want to show you down here. You can see this not reported, not because of anything you guys did. IPEDs changed their reporting system. They used to report all these different categories of expense, and these are standard categories, and they used to report all the different elements of it. They stopped doing so in their explanation because schools were just making all this stuff up. And it was all non-cash anyway. And so that's why we focus on just the salary part. And if I could just look at this for a second, these benefits, just hey, bear with me. The benefit rate, a benefit rate is, so this 88.1% benefit rate that they report for everybody in 2021 is benefit costs of $1.1 billion over base salary or total salaries of $1.3 billion. And I know you guys have great benefits in your state. You have wonderful state programs. There is no benefit rate on the human planet that is 88%. The cash benefit rates are typically in the low 30s in terms of the percentage retirement contribution that they make towards your retirement contribution, towards your retirement plan, and the health care. What do I mean by health care? Let's take a faculty member married with a family. The premium in your city where you live is probably about $25,000. My guess is you're paying roughly depending five, $6,000. The, the administration's paying 19 to 20. Well, that 19 to 20 is, that's, that's, that's what they're paying. But even that 19 to 20,000, plus what they put into your retirement plan, plus all, all the other state unemployment, federal unemployment, uh, workers' comp, those things are all tiny. There's no way these are right. There's just no way, which is one of the reasons IPED stopped. Now, they report the total benefits now for all the employees, but that's why they stopped. So these are just definitions of the different categories, and you can look at those later. So this is the salary distribution. So just bear with me. I promise you. But by the way, we're uh, we're getting to the end. I promised. Instructional salaries and research salaries together, you could see, are forty seven percent of of total salaries. Hospital is twenty nine percent. If I take the hospital out, instruction and research, you could see, is about two thirds of everything, which is fairly healthy. I can tell you, for a public university your size. And 
I know you like to think there's a lot of admins running around. That's not what the numbers are telling us here uh, in terms of institutional support. A lot, a lot of it could be categorization. This is, institutional support is main is upper level admin. These are all admin categories. All the non-yellow categories are admin, with one exception. I'm sure you guys have librarians in your bargaining unit. Librarians are in this category along with the deans. The deans and the associate deans on the academic side are with the librarians and the academic advisors, all in one category called academic services, academic support. So it makes looking at these categories kind of difficult. This, These two categories are pure us. This is pure them. If I'm allowed to use the us versus them language, hopefully I'm among friends that I can use that kind of language. So this is graphically what the expenses look like. Percentage change just from 20 to 21. The, the auxiliary revenues went down a lot, but so did the auxiliary expenses during the pandemic. Yeah, they didn't, the dorms weren't full and people weren't eating at the dining halls, but, and they weren't getting that revenue, but they also weren't paying for food. And you can see instruction went up the least of everything else. That's institute, that's admin. So here's auxiliaries. They always lost money. Even before the pandemic, they always lost money in auxiliaries. Housing, dining, student, you can see it up here. So you didn't borrow all that. Always had, always lost money. Lost more here, but always lost. So, all right. Number of faculty. I have a lot of different sources. I've got iPads. I've got the UIC office of OIR is the Office of Institutional Research. And then I've got the full-time equivalent, this is headcount, and then I got the common data set, and then I got the AUP. This does not include medical. This is non-medical. So it's hard for me to gather. I tried, what I try to do here is just show you, it's not as easy as you think to figure out who's working there, how many people work there. I wish they were one sort, but these are these, and all, I don't provide this. None of this data comes from me. All this data comes from probably different offices within UIC. So kind of messy. But what matters is the trends. And you guys have two bargaining units. You got this, these two together are in one unit, and this is in a separate unit. You can see the growth is more in a non tenure bargaining unit than it is in the tenure and tenure track unit. I don't know if you guys realize that, recognize it. Uh, whether you want it or not, it doesn't matter. It's just the way it is everywhere. Uh, and at my place, they will not hire a tenured faculty member anymore in almost any discipline. They they just won't. Uh, and we got, uh, we're, you know, we're all union, just like you guys are. And we got you know the same bargaining unit structure you do, but we're all the same union. But they just claim they can't afford a tenured faculty member anymore, which I think is a bit much. Uh, you know, a lot of people teaching, graduate students who are teaching. This is not grad research, just grad teaching. And there has been a decline of part-time faculty who are not in your unit. So. I don't know what you think about this, this being the largest number. It's not FTE, but still... I don't know how you feel about that. I don't know. I don't know what to say. Uh, you guys, maybe, I don't know. Just showing you what it is. So we have seen roughly similar changes between faculty and enrollment. These are these are in the same ballpark. There are there's not. I don't see a hiring freeze. Have you guys seen one? I don't see it. I have, I do not see a hiring freeze here. Is that accurate? Do they still hire? You guys still do search committees and bring new people in? Yes. Or, yeah. No. I, the numbers don't suggest there's a hiring freeze. Now, this is really messy data. It comes from the Office of Institutional Research. And these code, these are codes. I sound like uh, Chico Mark and Chico Marx and Day at the races, the Marx Brothers. None of you, none of you know, none, none of you know the Marx Brothers. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, the code book for the code book for the code book. 
that's what I sometimes feel like going through this data. But I do it because I maybe maybe we can get something from all this. I don't know what we get from all, I so I highlighted a couple of categories: faculty subtotal, though this is all the um, all the employees, department heads are included in this, the way they call it this. You can see, I'm afraid I'll have to go to it, but thanks. Okay, appreciate that. Administrators uh, support. So it's hard to make this enrollment. It's really messy data. And this is the conversation. Just let me get to graphs. So faculty, physicians, admins, all other staff, grad students. Interesting. You know, this is not atypical of a, and this is the compensation that's reported by the university. And then look at using those subgroups. I'm not seeing, if you look at this graph, everyone, the changes are about the same for everybody over all the sub periods. I'm not seeing much change of one subgroup really that different than another. The physician is probably doing a little better. But other than that, when I look at the percentage change in comp as reported by UIC, Office of Institutional Research, I'm not seeing much change. And in the number of administrators, yeah, it's a change, but the, the, the change in admin is less than the change in faculty and less than the change in enrollment. So I'm not seeing this huge move, this huge, I mean, I'm not... I got to tell the truth. I don't see this huge, big growth in admin over this time period. I just, I think they're doing fine, but, and whether you think that, whether you think this pie chart is okay or not, but if I did this pie, my point is if I did this pie chart for each of the last five years, it would look pretty similar to this, if you know what I'm saying. This pie chart is not changing for the last five years very much in terms of who's getting paid which I don't know, if, I think that's okay. Okay, faculty salaries, I've shown you guys this before. This is your faculty salaries, I added inflation. I use the Bureau, I'm sorry, I should, I hate using acronym. BLS is the equals, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Department of Labor. Uh, and so we have different categories in all ranks. I like the I, I I like using all ranks. I know we're supposed to look at the different ranks when we do the, when we do stuff, but I think for the different bargaining units you guys have, I know you guys are in two bargaining units, but I kind of like when everyone's together. Just I mean, not you, you can't do that. I know you, the way it's set up, but uh, it does give you s some sense of it. And I try look at inflation really has picked up. You can see that right here. You can see inflation and the graph. Uh, you guys losing a little ground towards inflation for all the different. This is the the graph here. The red bar are the all ranks. So this five percent is that five percent. This thirteen seven, all ranks, everybody together. Let's say we were all one big union. That would be the great gain versus inflation, and this over the seven year period. You can see it's a little different when you look at. The different categories as they're reported by IPES. These are the peer institutions from you guys. And I looked at it to see where you guys are right fit. You guys were kind of middle of the package on things like enrollment, level of tuition, cost of living, you were a little higher. But the peer group that they chose for you clearly had. It's the cost of living issue. Here's cost of living. Chicago, Rutgers, Seattle, Philadelphia, Orange County, Middle Nowhere, Connecticut, Riverside, California. You can see you guys are below. Look at the peer group they've chosen. Every peer that the admin chose has a cost of living significantly less than where you live in Chicago. Or, I'm allowed to use the phrase Chicago. I never liked the word Chicago land, but does anyone use that other than people on, on news newscasts? I mean, I I, I don't know I don't who uses Chicago land. Anyway, uh, I just don't think you belong with this group. That's my point. 
And I think these graphs prove it. These tables prove it. And miraculously, the all rank salary has you guys, the union group, and you guys did, didn't cherry pick. You guys are here. And here you are in the admin group. This makes a difference at the table. I think it does. I mean, who the peers are, I mean, they're saying you're the highest paid and you guys are proving, well, you we're not the highest paid. So, and this, and the good thing I like about this data is it's, it's against all the ranks. You don't have to worry. You don't have to argue. I know you have different teams and all, but, and you can extract, it would be the same if you pulled out the different groups, but I like putting everybody together. That's what I did here. Cause I'm sure there are people from both group, all the groups here. So last thing, go flames. Athletic deficit, you don't take in hardly anything. Just here's some graphs. I promise I'll be quick now. Graphs, expenses, direct revenues, deficit. Subsidies, uh, using the USA Today data and the Knight Commission. 91% of the expenses are subsidized. What does that mean? The athletic department is not close to self-supporting. Their direct revenues... do not come close to covering the expenses. So the academic side has to subsidize. This plus this, the direct athletic revenues plus the subsidy gets me athletic, covers the, uh, these athletic expenses. And I, they get a point too. Let me see, do I have it? Let me get it. They get a point right here. See that zero? For ticket sales in 21, they're going to say, look, the reason that was zero was because of the pandemic. No one can go to the games. Remember, they had the cardboard stuff and no one went. However, look at their ticket sales before there was a pandemic. It wasn't like, no, don't, again, I'm not being facetious and mean, but I don't remember there being huge lines to go to basketball games. I've been to one of your games. No offense, it was family and friends who were at the game. And maybe that's changed, but I doubt it. Uh, you don't sell that many tickets to your games. You can't, they can't say, my point is this, athletics is really, unless it's bringing in some sort of recognition, donations, et cetera, it is really hurting the university financially. And I'm a big sports fan, but they, it really is. And I don't know if you guys feel that, think that, believe that, have always felt that. I can't, it's hard to know. But the number, this picture tells a bad story. And I look at a lot of this stuff. And here are your peers. Uh, temple, the reason I say no temple, they're private. So they don't, we don't get their stuff. They're private university. So in, in, in Pennsylvania, even though they're not public the way you guys are, in Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth, they're, they're basically get less than 5% less than of their revenue from the state. So they're, they're not public yet. They don't get appropriations the way we do. Now, Rutgers has a $42 million subsidy, 49%. They actually get some people go to their games, but they still, they're in the Big Ten. They have to keep up with everyone in the Big Ten. You guys only spend $16 million, but you don't cover it. Most of it's not covered. The Horizon League, you guys are the biggest subsidy in the Horizon League. That's your conference. Dollar and percentage-wise, that's not good. Uh, so last thing, good news. I'm asking, ending on good news. Maybe not negotiation related, but just maybe some light stuff at the end here. This is class size. Uh, uh, no one used Chicago. Good. I'm glad to hear that no one used Chicago because I thought I always thought it was late. Uh, this is how many how many sections are there with two to nine students? How many sections have ten to nineteen? And how many sections have more than a hundred? I mean, and so. This is the number of sections in each year and the percentage of those sections. The graph will tell the story as always. And so you can see the shift I see is fewer of these small classes, but not a huge shift to the really big ones. But these small ones just, may, they're probably not letting any classes less than 10 go and not that many less than 20 go. Uh, some, but they're definitely moving away from the really small ones and making sure there's, you can see the shift down and up towards here. And these not really moving all that much. So I didn't see a big shift in class size other than them not allowing really small classes. And I don't know if that's your experience, but that's what the data shows you. Good news, you guys graduate some people. 
degrees conferred, uh, bachelor's, master's, doctorates in the professional programs, of course. And this is all really good news. Retention rates. This is a really high one-year retention rate, whether you believe it or not. Even these are undergraduate students only. Uh, your graduation rates may not look that high, but I work at a place where we have we don't hit 40. So uh, to me, I think it's high. And I'll tell you why I think it's high. First, it's increasing, which is nice. And it's lower than your peers. But this, the percentage of students, look at this. 51% of your students are Pell Grant. 51% of your undergraduate students are receiving Pell Grants. That is a very different population than most of your peers. The only peer that's similar to yours is UC Riverside, which may be surprising. But UConn, you have two and a half times percentage-wise of Pell Grant students as UConn. You're not going to have the same graduation rate. And it's going to take longer. So I thought that was good news. And I'm done. So just over an hour. How do you like that? All right, Howard. Uh, that was a lot. Uh, thank you for all of that. I, I apologize for being a lot. I, I, I know that. But what do you want? <laughs> so I'm not taking room, it back. So we've got the room here for 10 more minutes. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, we have a little bit of time for some little Q&A here at the end. I see there's been a variety of kind of commentary in the chat. I don't know that I see any explicit questions there, but if anybody has one, feel free to raise your hand and I'll call on you, or you could put questions in the chat and we could bring them in that way as well. Um, so like I said, we'll need to be out of here in, a, in about 10 minutes at 4.50. Kate. Hi. Um, I, so one of the questions I asked in the chat that um, I thought, okay, so you were saying that the number of administrators didn't go up, but it looked like when you were talking about administrator salaries that they seem to be growing. Yeah, uh, let's, let's look at that. I, I, I understand. So let, 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 let's, let's, let's focus on that. So if we look at the, let me uh, get, get, there's a couple of things going on there. So let me, let's, let's focus back on that. Get those, get that data. I mean, because that would be a that would be a good comparison, right? Like you're not giving, you know, administrative salaries have gone up twenty percent, but ours have gone up two percent or whatever it is. Yeah, but I'm not. So this is the total pay. So I'm seeing 104 million, 100. This is administrative right here, 104, and now, yeah, 135 to 141. Faculty 354 to 344 to 354 in this year. It's not that much of a difference. It's really not that much of a difference. Percentage-wise, it's maybe a little higher here. You know, if we start, if we start here from 116 million in 218 to 2022, that's a 25 million increase. Faculty pay from 289 to 354, well, that's a 65 million dollar increase. Percentage-wise, it's almost the exact same, and so the but okay, dollars. But if, if you take it by, um, so if you take those numbers divided by the actual number of people holding those positions, I guess is what I'm trying try to, to get, get an at. The per person, yeah, like a, the difference. I don't think you'd get anything because okay, this, because I, I because I don't when you look at the numbers. So let's let me tell you why. Uh, I think you get a, maybe a little bit because the number of admins, it's a little, uh, look what happened to the number of admins. It went from 1508, you see, down to 1484, you see that there? Mm -hmm. And the number of faculty, you know, is, is going up constantly. And then the, the number of admins, I have, we do see right there from 19 to 22, we see a pretty healthy increase in admins after several years where they were actually going down, especially right here. There was a big decline here, and then it picked up again. If we did it on a per person basis, my guess is the numbers, the difference would be not anything to write home about. Uh, I, you know, when I looked at, this graph really tells a story because it, you don't get it year to year, you get a, longer term you look at the green and you compare it to the red the total pay 